Praise the Lord, brethren. Is this the song of our heart? That we want to tell him that we love him more than anything? Oh, beloved.
we would have the very life that is in God and our life will be unborrowed, underived. We will not anymore die. We would live forever. We would live as God lives, having his very own life. Amen. That's an amazing. God has been good to us. I, I, I feel sad this morning because the devil attacks. Brother Jonathan is down this morning. His wife is not here. Cheryl and her family, they're not here because the devil attacks them. Sister Gloria is not here because she has been attacked. And Sister Bobby has been attacked. She's attacked by the enemy. So that is not here this morning. But God is good, beloved. God is good. Let us by God's grace be faithful. I want to speak to us. Brother Randy, I try to remember, I was thinking about you this week. You have told me something about preaching as someone more than once. I can't remember exactly how you say it. If you don't preach it. At least ten times from a different perspective. From a different perspective. I thank you, brother. I thank God that you are here this morning. Because this message, I have, I have preached this message before, but I decided to preach it in a different way this morning, again. So I have, after the day, I got eight more to go to get it right. <laughs> uh, let us bow our heads, beloved. Our eternal God and our Father, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your great love, Lord, your love that is infinite. Thank you for giving us the greatest gift ever given to humanity. The gift of your own self through your son. And precious Savior, this morning, this is the day that you have made. And here we are as your people in recognition as you as the great creator. We are waiting upon you this morning, Lord. You have fed us all through the week with physical bread. And now we wait for you, dear Father to feed us with bread from off the altar. Open our minds and give to us a good understanding, dear Lord. Let your spirit speak and give us air to hear and give us a mind to understand, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If I were to ask you a question, why are you here this morning, beloved? What is your reason? What is the purpose for you being in this world? Why do God allow you? Why do God allow me to be born into this world, beloved? For what reason? Because if the way we born and we die the very way we were born, it makes no sense. We are going to be lost. We are going to be burnt up for our transgression. So why are you here this morning? Why am I here this morning? I want to share this statement with you, beloved. Like our Savior. <coughs> like our Savior, we are in this world to do service for God. We are here to become like God in character. Why are we here, beloved? <laughs> to become like God in character. And by a life of service to reveal him to the world in order to be co-workers with God, in order to become like him and to reveal his character, we must know him aright. We must know him as he revealed himself. And knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and of all true service. It is the only safeguard against temptation it is this alone that can make us like God in government. Amen. Oh, beloved, we need a knowledge of God. Do we know Him? Do we know Him? And how can we know someone who we cannot see? Someone who do not speak to us directly. How can we know Him? I want us to know, beloved, 
from ever since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. The great Jehovah, God the Father, have no dealing personally with humanity. He have never dealt, he have never spoken to any man. The only man we read about that God the Father spoke to is his son. He spoke to him on the bank of the Jordan. This is my beloved son. He spoke to him on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And he spoke to him in the temple court. God the Father spoke three times from the fall of man to humanity. And that is to Jesus our believer. Because the Bible tells us that this God dwells in a light that is unapproachable. And Jesus came and he, a man by the name of Nicodemus who was a teacher in Israel uh, wanted to know about this God. So he went to Jesus and he said, Lord, you, we know you as a teacher come from God. And Jesus began that discourse with Nicodemus and Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again from above. And Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, no man have ever seen God. Listen to what Jesus says, beloved. No man have ever seen God. But the Son of God, who is in the bosom of God, he come to reveal that God. And in Jesus praying, John 17, 3, he says, This is life eternal, that they, that who is the they now? That we might know thee, the only true God. How can we know him, beloved? He says, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. So if you want to know God, beloved, you better know Jesus. Hosea, yes. yes. chapter 4, verse 6 says, my people, who beloved? His people. Yes. He says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest unto me, seeing thou hast for, for, forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. So hear what God says, beloved. He says, we have rejected knowledge. What kind of knowledge? The knowledge of who God is. And who is this knowledge of God? His Son, Jesus, the one who come to reveal God to us. God says, you reject knowledge. And where do we find how God is? In His law. If you go into the book of Exodus 22 and 23, Moses said to God, he says, show me your glory. He said, tell me your name. And God says, I will pass before thee. And the Lord proclaimed the Lord God, the Lord. And he began to describe to Moses his glory, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundance in truth and goodness. Amen. So to know God is to know his character. Otherwise we have no part with him. He says he will reject us from being a priest. You know, we are famous for saying we are a royal priesthood. But God says, he will, and Peter says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Who are those royal priesthood? Those who have the right knowledge of God. Because we just read in Hosea, he says he will reject you from being priest to him because you have reject knowledge. And so here the Bible says, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praise of him who have called me from darkness to the marvelous light. What is the light? The character of God, his righteousness. Something we do not have. We don't possess that. We cannot possess it on our own. Because we have sinned, but Jesus possessed it, beloved. Ephesians 1 17. How do we get this knowledge, beloved? Ephesians 1 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, yes, the Bible says, beloved, we got to read the scripture intelligently, beloved. We need the Spirit of God to help us to understand when we read the Word of God. Here the Bible says, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. So wait. So Jesus have a God. 
The Bible says that Jesus God is the God. And Jesus says, isn't Jesus God below them? Yes. But he's the only God that have a God. Keep that in your mind. The Bible says that you may give, that he may give unto you what? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of himself. Who is going to give you that? We need what is speaking about the Father. The Father is the one going to give it to us. But how does the Father give it to us? That is the question. 1 Corinthians 1, 21 verse 30 says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God. Who is Christ, beloved? The power of God. The, power of God. the Bible also called him the right hand of God. Isn't that so? Because everything from the fall of man, is, it is Jesus. Taking the train of Israel from bondage, Jesus. Leading Abraham from the land of Ur to the promised land, Jesus. Everything is Jesus because man have been cut off from God by sin. Remember what Paul tells us in 1 in, in, in Timothy? He says we have how many, how many advocates with God? One. So God is the advocate. God is the one who stands between God and man. So the Bible says, but of him, that is of, because of God, but of him, that in him is God, or we can say because of God, ye are in Christ Jesus. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So here the Bible says, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us what? Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. So we want to know God. We got to know Jesus. John 14, 16 and 6 and 17 says, Jesus said unto him, Now they're speaking now, that is just a little while, few hours before he, he, he's going to die on Calvary. And he's speaking to them, and Thomas says, show us the way. Mm. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. No man coming to the Father. Hear what Jesus says. Who is the Father? The God. No man coming unto the Father but by me, even the... And then he wants to say this, in verse 17 now, even the spirit of truth, he says in verse 14, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And verse 17 now he's saying, even the spirit of truth, who is the spirit of truth, beloved? Christ. Christ. He says, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. That's the question I asked this morning. Do we know him, beloved? This is whom we need to know in order to have a relationship or the character of God. We need to know Jesus. He says, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Is he in you this morning? What is the hope of glory, beloved? Christ in you, the hope of glory or the hope of character, the hope of eternal life. Christ in you. Letter 66, April 10, 1894, paragraph 18. The Lord is soon to come. Who is soon to come, beloved? The Lord. The Lord. Who is the Lord? Jesus. Jesus. He's coming back, beloved. That used to be the message, used to be proclaimed. He's coming back. The second coming of Jesus. People don't speak about it. We don't speak about it no more. We're not excited about it no more. In 1888, all around the world, believers were excited because they were saying Jesus was coming. They were excited. They sold the house, they sold the land, they sold everything. Pay off the debt. Because Jesus is coming. But here she says, we, we want a complete and perfect understanding which the Lord Christ alone can give. You hear that, beloved? which Christ alone can give a perfect understanding is what we want. It is not safe to catch the spirit from another. Oh, beloved. Hear that, beloved. Who is the other? Who is the other? Satan. It is not safe to have Satan's spirit. Holy 
writing, 54 and 55. Very important to read. It is not safe to have the Spirit from another. I mean, sorry, 56. We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. Who is the Holy Spirit you want, beloved? Jesus. You know, this statement was locked up in a ball for many, many years until this year. Early this year, they had to let it out. Because somebody hacked Mrs. White Estate from Australia. They had to let it out. We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ, beloved. The Bible teaches that. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, what does it say, beloved? No. The first Adam was made a living soul. The second Adam, who is Jesus, was made a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. Only Jesus could give us life, beloved. Galatians 4, verse 5 and verse 6 tells us that also. The Bible says, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts that we can call God what? Abba, Abba Father. Do you know without Jesus you cannot call God your Father? It's an impossibility. You've got to become a partaker of the divine nature and the only way we become a partaker of God's divine nature is by receiving the life of Jesus into our life. Yes, if we commune with God, we shall we have strength and grace and efficiency. If we commune with God, what does Jesus say when he rose from the dead? He says, some power is given unto me. That's what he says. Oh. All power is given unto him. Let me ask you a question this morning, beloved. I have a bottle here full of cookies. And I take this bottle of cookies and I give it to Brother Randy. How many cookies does Brother Randy have? Oh. oh. If you want a cookie now, who got to give it to you? Oh, hallelujah. You got it right. So if you want, the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 34, the Bible says God did not give his son, his spirit, with measure. But we don't measure. In John 1, it says, Of his fullness you have received. So if you want it, who got to give it to you? Yes. Hallelujah. Nobody else. Got to give it to you, but Jesus. He's the Son of the living God. There is only one being in the universe who is like God. His name is Michael, Michael the Archangel, the commander of the heavenly host. I want to give you some historical fact now. Life magazine, you know, they tell us that there is three gods. Three gods. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Life magazine. This is a Catholic magazine. Do you know Protestantism was not just Sabbath keepers? Do you know that? I say was not. Sabbath keepers. Protestantism mean, what does Protestantism mean, beloved? To protest. And every, mostly every religious organization in the world was protesting against one denomination. Rome. Today we all come back home with Mama. And we are in her bosom. We're not protesting no more. But this is what the Catholic Church says. This is Life Magazine, it's a Catholic magazine. This is what it says. Our opponent sometimes claimed to be, claimed that no belief should be held dogmatically, that means positively. Which is not explicitly stated in the scripture. But the Protestant churches have themselves accepted such dogma as the dogma means a settled opinion or a principle. She said, as the Trinity for which there is no precise authority in the gospel. 
You cannot find it in the word of God. Rome says, you know, I, I, I love, I bought a Roman Catholic. And I love Rome for this reason. They does not hide. When they want to be bold, they let you know exactly how it is. She said you can find it in the word of God. But you say you hold on to it. And you're protesting against us. Does that make sense? Let's look a little bit. Encyclopedia International, volume 18, page 226. It says the doctrine of the Trinity did not form a part of the apostle preaching as is reported in the New Testament. It did not form a part of the gospel. Where does it come from? Is that an important question? Where does it come from? This now is a secular book. It's not so beloved. This is a book that the world has an encyclopedia. Anybody could go read it. New International Encyclopedia, volume 23, page 47. It says this now. The Trinity Doctrine, the Catholic Faith. Is what, beloved? And this encyclopedia now is a Roman Catholic encyclopedia. It says the Trinity doctrine, the Catholic faith, this is, faith is this, we worship one in Trinity. We worship one God in three beings. But there is one trusting of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. That's what they say. Is that your God? Is this your God? Let's read below. God in three persons. This doctrine may, in many ways, present strange paradox. You know what that means? That's what paradox means. It's strange, unusual, not known, not seen. It says, Paradox means full of contradiction. He said the Trinity doctrine, the doctrine of three God and one God, is full of contradiction. That's what he says. It says it was the very first doctrine dealt with systematically by the church. Yet it is still one of the most misunderstood, disputed doctrines. Further, it is not clearly or explicitly taught anywhere in scripture. I want to tell you something. 325 years after our Redeemer, Savior, and Lord, in AD 325, that's when they trump up this doctrine. Seventh-day Adventists never used to believe it. Never, 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 never believed that. But today we do. Why? Question. Let's read. She said, yet it is widely regarded as a central doctrine, indispensable to the Christian faith. It what? Indispensable. Don't you tell somebody about the Trinity? They're ready to tear it to pieces. Look online, beloved. It is only with the fathers of the churches. Who, whose father? My father? Yes, they used to be my father. I born a Roman Catholic. They used to be my father. I divorced them. They're not my daddy anymore. In the turn of the 4th century, that a full-fledged theory of the incarnation developed, attempt to trace the origin still earlier to the Old Testament literature cannot be supported by historical critical scholarship. The formal doctrine of the Trinity as it was defined by the great church council of the 4th and 5th century is not to be found in the New Testament. You can find it in the Word of God. Our doctrine must be solo scripture. Scripture only. The people of God. The doctrine is not found in its full developed form in scripture. Modern theology does not seek to find it in the Old Testament. At the time of the Reformation, Protestant churches took over the doctrine of the Trinity without serious examination. This is where it comes from. They take it from Rome and they run with it. Adventist Review, January 6, 1994. Adventist belief have changed over the years under the impact of present truth. 
They call the Trinity present truth. Is that present truth, beloved? Yes, it's in a sense, it's, it's a present lie. It's a truth we never hold before. But you want to say, more startling the teaching regarding Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Many of the pioneers, including James White, J. Andrews, Uriah Smith, J. H. Wagner, held to an Aryan, semi Aryan view. Amen. That's not true. Huh? That's true. You know what I said? That is the Son at some point in time before the creation of the world was generated by the Father. Likewise, the Trinitarian understanding of God, no part of our fundamental belief, was not generally held by all the Adventists. Even today, a few do not subscribe to it. Adventists never believed this dogma of Rome. But today, we hold on to it. It became a part of our church officially when? 1986. Dallas, Texas. I was, I didn't want to say how old I was in 1986. I didn't want to go back and look for it to see how old I was when this became a part. So in other words, for all the years of my life until 1986, this was not a part of our faith. Officially. Harper Collins Bible Encyclopedia. This is a Catholic Encyclopedia. Today, however, scholars generally agree that there is no doctrine of the Trinity as such in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. It would go far beyond the intention and thought from the Old Testament to suppose that a late 4th century or 13th century Christian doctrine can be found there. Likewise, the New Testament does not contain an explicit doctrine of the Trinity. These are stuff that we're going to read, beloved. I'm not a scholar. I've not been to Andrews or Oakwood or any university to get my bachelor degree in theology. But we have the Word of God. Amen. And God has called us as a people. And God has given to us something more. We have what is called the Spirit of Prophecy. Ministry Magazine, October 1993, page 10. Most of the founding fathers, founders of the Adventist, of Adventism, would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe. That means to accept, to endorse, to support the top the, the denomination of fundamental belief. Most specifically, most would not be able to agree with belief number two which deal with the doctrine of the Trinity. Neither could most of the leading Adventists agree with the fundamental belief number five, which imply the personhood of the Holy Spirit. This is our literature, beloved. And they're telling us, but yet we read it, but yet we say we're going to hold with what you give us. But they say the foundation did not have it. What does the Bible say about the foundation? If the foundation be moved, what shall happen? How can the righteous stand? The house will fall. A guide to, to, relate to, to, the, to the religion of America by Leo Watson. This, I witness the amazing. He asked this question to Uncle Otto, Otto Maxwell. And Otto Maxwell gave him the answer. The question was, do Seventh-day Adventists worship the Trinity? You get the question. You can read your Bible from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to the close of the book, Revelation 22, and you will not find one passage of scripture where the word of God tells us that we must worship a being called the Holy Spirit. Can you find in the Bible where the Bible says you must worship Jesus, beloved? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that when God brings forth his son, God says, let the angels worship him. Because he's the son of God. But not the Holy Spirit. We don't worship the Holy Spirit. Let's read, beloved. It says, so he asked the question, he says, they do, they worship Trinity. Reverently, they worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one God. And they do so because they believe this to be the teaching of the Bible concerning God in his relation to the world and to the human race. 
You see, that's why we worship them. We believe according to the word of God. Oh, beloved, Jesus is coming back, beloved. But he's coming for a people. A people in whose life reflect the very life of God. Question and doctrine. Have you ever had heard of this book? Anybody ever heard of this book? I have a copy of it. You know how it come to be, beloved? Do you know how this book come about to be? Well, there was a man from Pennsylvania. His name was Dr. Barnhouse. He was a Presbyterian minister. And Dr. Barnhouse preached a message on righteousness by faith. Do you know that there was such thing as righteousness by faith? We teach them to. There is righteousness by the faithfulness of Jesus. We only get righteous by Jesus' faith, not our faith. And he preached this message and on who was the president of the Pennsylvania Conference. He called him up to commend him on his message. And Dr. Bano says, but I bet this don't believe in righteousness by faith. How oh, is man calling me to commend me? You know, we read about 1888. Do you know what happened in 1888? There were two young ministers, Wagner and A.T. Jones. General conference session, they preach a message. And if you read the 1888 material, you realize that the servant of the Lord says it was putting Christ back in his rightful place. Justification by faith, not righteousness by faith. You must be able to distinguish what justification is and what righteousness is. You are justified not in righteousness but in your sinfulness. You come to God and say, Father have mercy. Forgive me I have sinned against thee and against heaven. And God justify you for Christ's sake. He make you as you have never sinned. Amen. That's justification. But righteousness now. What is righteousness? What is righteousness? It's right doing. You know the Bible tells us about a being that have faith. The Bible calls his name in the book of James. He calls his name Satan. The Bible says Satan believe and tremble. And James says. Faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. So you got to walk beloved. But you don't walk. To become righteous. You are justified by faith. And God gave you enabling grace now. To walk in obedience now. To his commandment. You don't keep his commandment. To become righteous. God accredited the righteousness of his son to your life. And now by faithfulness to God. Through the enabling grace of Christ. You will walk in obedience now. You don't walk in obedience to be saved. Church man, you are page 23. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A unity of three co eternal person. Let me ask you a question, beloved. Did Jesus die? Yeah. You believe he died? Yeah. Was he really dead? Huh? The Bible says he was dead. So, how could he die? How could he die if there is three beings that make up one God? And all three have to die. All three have to die. And the Father cannot die. Because the Father is immortality inherent. He cannot die. Neither can he change. The Bible says God cannot change. So here what it so says, a unity of three co eternal person. God is immortal. Immortality cannot die, beloved. You know, Adam had what kind of immortal? Adam had dependable immortality. If he did not eat, he would have become immortal. You remember what God says? He put an angel around the tree with a flaming soul. Lest he take up, eat, and eat, and become what? Immortal. He was not immortal. 
So the Bible says, they say, God is immortal, all powerful, all knowing, above all, ever present. If he's ever present, how did Jesus die? But you see, beloved, because Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus could change, but God cannot change. I read this morning, the servant of the Lord says, it is a marvel to the angels how Jesus become a human being. They don't understand that. I don't understand either what he could change if he the son of God. She says, so he is infinite, beyond human comprehension, yet knowing, yet known through his self-revelation, he is ever, he is forever worthy of worship, adoration, service by the whole creation. God the Father is the creator, source, sustainer and sovereign of all creation. Look at this. If there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how can the Father now be the source and the sustainer and the sovereign of all creation? Does that make sense to you, beloved? Do it make sense? That's what I have been taught. That's what we have been taught today. But it doesn't make no sense, beloved. If my wife and myself and my daughter Latisha are one, we have everything in common together. How can I be the head of it? We all have to be co ruled We all own it. It belongs to every one of us equally. God, our eternal Father, is created the sins. The quality and power exhibited in the Son and the Holy Ghost are also revelation of the Father. How if the tree makes one, how can this two now be revealed in the Father? Something doesn't make no sense in my mind, beloved. <coughs> this is not, not new to me from in New York into heaven. I have a discussion with my elder, Elder Glaze. How can those things be? It's confusing my mind. Look at this now. This is one of the Trinity logos. It says the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Something wrong somewhere. We have our Bible. Church Manual 24. God the eternal Son became incarnate in Jesus. You could go back now from 1842 and you could read all the way back when the pioneers was alive and you will not find that statement anywhere. You could take your Bible and you will not find that statement anywhere. She said, through him all things were created. What did we just read a while ago, beloved? They said the Father is the great source. But now they tell us through the Son all things was created. Through him all things created, the character of God is revealed, the salvation of humanity is, accept, is accomplished, and the world is judged forever truly God, he becomes also truly man, Jesus the Christ. Let me ask you a question this morning. I want you to think, beloved. Put your thinking cap on, beloved. Are you a believer? Are you a son of God? A child of God this morning. Are you a child of God? Amen. We are children of God. We believe that. Yes. Are you completely human? Amen. Do you have divinity in you? No. no. Think, beloved. Think. Yeah, yeah. Do you have divinity in you? In Christ, we must become a partaker of his divinity. Yes. Can I see your divinity by itself? No. It is combined with your humanity. You see, Jesus come to earth and he became a human being. But he was of a twofold nature, human and divine. But those two nature was mysteriously blended together. And so when we become children of God, the divine and the human become one. You understand what I'm trying to say, beloved? Uh, so, Jesus, when he was here, was fully divine and fully human. We are not like that. 
We are partaker. You understand the difference, right? We are partaker. So guess you want to say this. God, the eternal spirit, was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation and redemption. God, the eternal spirit, was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation and redemption. That incarnation means when Christ became a human being. When you read in Psalm 34, Genesis 1.26, the Bible says, and the Spirit of God move upon the face of the water. And then when you go now in Psalm 34, the psalmist tell you, it says, by the breath, the roar of his mouth, what the heaven made. So the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the water in creation, it was the word of God. When God speak, something must happen. Jesus says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are roar and life. That's what Jesus said. He said, my word that comes from me, when my word goes forth, it must go and do exactly what I say. We are not like that, beloved. Amen. We speak and our word hit, hit the world and it bounces back and comes right back to us. But when Jesus speaks, Amen. something happens. Amen. Amen. His word, spirit of life. That what Acts, Acts 17, 29, the Bible says, For as much then that we are the offspring of God. We are what? Offspring. He's our creator. It says, We ought not to think that the Godhead, this is a word that confuses us today. And the simple definition for this word Godhead is divinity. That's the only definition you have for the word Godhead, divinity or divine nature. It says, we force much as we are the offspring of God. We come from him. He made us. He says, we ought not to think that a divine being or the divine nature is like unto gold and silver or stone grieved by the art of man's hands. We are God. We, we descend from him. How can you look at yourself and think that there is not a divine being? You make a, a, a little statue and you worship this little thing. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him, of who is in him? God. Invisible things. What? Invisible things. His power. Let's read, beloved. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. His eternal power, his divine nature. God. Let's see, the only other being that is like that now. Colossians 1, 9 and 10 says, For in him that is in Christ, for in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Not some. We, have, we are partakers, beloved. But if we endure to the end, if we endure to the end, Brother Randy, we'll become will endure and will have the fullness of God in us. We will become like God in character. Amen. Amen. He says, so that they are without excuse. Verse 19 says, how did Jesus get his divinity? How did he become a full divine being as his father? How did he come like that? Verse 19 says, for it pleased the father that in him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell. That is the Father's prerogative that Jesus be like him in character. Amen. We have a simple demonstration. When you look at creation, look at Stalin and his wife sitting together. Lou and Anthony sitting together. God made a man. He take the dust, and he formed that man, he shaped him. And then Jesus went down and he breathes in him life. Amen. The man wake up, the man is vigorous and he moving about. And the man look at the man see, he see father, he see son. God and Christ. But he see himself alone. Wait, 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 where's the other one that is like me? See what God do now, beloved. Demonstration of the Father and the Son. Jesus did not go back to the dust now. Women, you are special. Women are special and unique. Jesus did not go back to the dust. 
He went to the man. He put him to sleep. And he take a rib. And the Bible says, from that rib, oh, the mystery of God, he built Sister Lou. Amen. And he bring her to Adam. Amen. Where did Sister Lou come from? From Adam. Where was she in existence before? Yes, in him. Hallelujah. She was in the man. That's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Abraham, that, that, that Levi, who was exempt from paying tithes, the Bible says Levi paid tithes in Abraham. That's spiritual things, beloved. In the same way, the divinity of Jesus is eternal as God is eternal. But his personality, as a person, as Sister Luke came out from Brother Anthony, so the son in some mysterious ways, we don't know, I'm not going into this detail, how he comes, but the Bible says he proceeded forth and come forth from God. That's what Jesus said. Amen. And then he said, Father, in his prayer, he says, Father, I have given them your word. And they, are, they have believed that I have surely have come out from you, Father. They believe that. That was Jesus' prayer on behalf of the disciples. Desire of ages, page 21. All things Christ received from God. How many things, beloved? All. all. Is that including his life? Yes. All things Christ received from God, but he took to give so in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for created beings. Through the beloved Son, the Father life flows out to all. Through the Son, it returned in praise and joyous service. Do you see how we praise God, beloved? We praise God in Christ. You cannot praise God out of Jesus. John 10, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. No man, he says, I am the door. He said, you try to enter in some other way. You is a robber and a thief. You want to get to my father? He said, I'm the doorkeeper. I let in those who I know have a right to come in. And I keep those out who have no right. I am the doorkeeper, he says. That is the only way we have access to God, beloved, through the Son of the living God, the Father and the Son. Daniel 7 was spoken. Look at this, beloved. And there was given unto him what? Christ. There was given to Christ dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nation, and language should serve him. That means everybody should worship Jesus. He is worthy of worship. He is the Son of God. The Father who gave everything to him. The Bible says his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom which shall never be destroyed. John 5, 26, Jesus says, For I the Father have life in himself. What kind of life does the Father have? Self-inherent life. No one can take the Father's life away from him. Jesus said, As my Father have life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Where does Jesus' life come from, beloved? Would it make sense that if I am God, my son Hananiah is God, and brother Randy, my brother, we are three gods. Would it make sense for brother Randy to give me life? I am God, I have it already. Why would you give me what I have? I don't want it, I don't need it. But Jesus said, my father gave me life. And he didn't say just life. And you notice what the Lord says? She says, this life is not a life like what a son, adopted sons of God have. This life, I have, this life is not the same life. Daniel 7, 9 and 30. I beheld thrones were cast down. I beheld a throne. In other words, the Bible said, Daniel says, he beheld thrones were set. In the olden times, they would take the, the, the mud and spread it out on the ground, and the people sit down. And so that's what Daniel is speaking about. We've got to put our mind in the time set when they were speaking. He said, I beheld Shrobo Castle, the ancient of days, did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his hair like pure wool. 
His throne was like a fiery flame. His wheels as burning fire. Who is the ancient of days? Ancient. What is ancient mean, beloved? Old. And he said the ancient of days. Look at this now. Verse 13. I saw in the night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? We are told that in the Bible, that word Son of Man is used 84 times. In the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And 82 times in that statement, Jesus refers himself to as the Son of Man. It says, He came with the cloud of heaven. That means the angels bring him to the Father. And came to the ancient of days, and they brought him the head before him. How many people are here now, beloved? How many people is involved here? The Son of Man come to the ancient of days. That's how many? Two. 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 Father and Son. Let's look at it. First Timothy 3, 13 and 16 says, I give the charge in the sight of God, who quickened all things and before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Let's read verse 16 now. He said, He give us charge in the sight of God. The scripture is very plain, beloved. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> when we read the word of God without our preconceived opinion, when we read the word of God laying aside what Brother Strong said, laying aside what Brother Anthony said, but when we read the scripture with the mindset of God, we're going to have a different picture in our mind. So the Bible says now, verse 16 says, who only have immortality. Don't Jesus have immortality? Don't the heavenly angels have immortality? So but the Bible says, God alone have immortality. What does that mean? What does that mean? If Jesus had it, the angels have it, but he said, God alone have it, who only have immortality, here he tells you why God alone have it. What does he mean by that? He says, because God quickened, that means give it life. He said, God is the author, the source of life. That's why the Bible says he alone has it. The Bible is not denying the fact that Jesus have immortal life. The Bible is saying that God is immortal inherent. He alone is a source of immortality. And he gave it to his son that his son may give it to us. It says, dwelling in a light which no man can approach unto, whom no man had seen. Don't men see Jesus? So this is not speaking about Jesus. Dwelling in a light which no man had seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Romans 8 and 11 says, that's God the Father. We're talking now about the Holy Spirit now. But if the Spirit of Him in the spirit of what? Amen. He didn't say God the spirit. He said the spirit of him. The spirit that belongs to him. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. The next thing to do, beloved. Do you know today? We are being taught that Jesus raised himself from the dead. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever heard that? Do you believe that? Or if, if he raised himself from the dead, he was not dead, he was alive. And I know he cannot lie because he's the son of God. The servant of the Lord, she says, all that Jesus had slept in the tomb with him. Everything was in that tomb with him. And on that resurrection morning when Gabriel comes and say, thy father called thee, the life that he laid down now, he comes back up with that very same life. But here he says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by the spirit that dwelleth in you. We just read that it is the spirit of God, that, that it is God who quickens all things. So here he's saying now that his spirit is what quickens. Let's read, beloved. Read country verse 479 says, The ancient of days is God the Father. Amen. 
Says the psalmist, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm 90 verse 2. It is He, the Ancient of Days, the source of all beings. The source of how many beings, beloved? Does that include Jesus? Yes. yes. The source of all beings. It says, and the fountain of all law that is to preside in the judgment and holy angels and ministers and witness in number 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands attend the great tribunal. That's what Daniel speak about in Daniel chapter 7. The judgment was set and the books were opened. Deuteronomy 8, verse 19. It shall come to pass if you ever, ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish. I want us to know, beloved, and those who will see the message via the internet, on YouTube, I want us to know if we have any other God besides Jehovah God. And if we worship any other being besides the Father and His Son, we are going to perish, beloved. We are going to perish. That means we are going to lose eternal life. Look at this, beloved. Hear, O Israel, verse, chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One God. Is Jesus God? He is God. He is God. I think it's page 34, Patriarchs and Prophets. Servant of the Lord says, from the fall of man, God has given this world into the hand of Christ. Read it for yourself. If there is a people in the world who should never be confused, should be saved in this. But I believe we are the most confused people in the world today. Seven day Adventists. You know what I mean? when you when you use that word, seven day Adventists mean people who keep the seventh day Sabbath. People who are looking forward to the second advent of Jesus. That's all Adventists, seven day Adventists mean. But we are the most confused. You know why? Because we don't read our Bible no more. Somebody had to read and interpret for us. Read it for yourself, beloved. Lord, what are you saying to me? Please reveal to me what you are saying in your word to me. Because when I read my Bible, I'm not reading it for my wife. Because what God will tell me from that verse, he will show us something differently. He will show Sister Kelly something differently. Because what is from me, maybe not what she needs. So when you read the word of God, say, Lord, you show me what you want me to see for myself in your word. 